Welcome to Voices in Leadership, live streamed worldwide from the Leadership Studio at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. I'm Dean Michelle Williams. The goal of Voices is to highlight the experiences of leaders confronting major public health frontiers and to better understand effective leadership and how it can affect change. I hope you find this program engaging and informative. Thank you for joining us. Hello and welcome to those of you here in the studio and to our viewers online around the globe. I'm Eric Anderson, the director of Voices in Leadership. This series focuses on effective leadership to create positive change in public health. We're broadcasting from the Leadership Studio where the programs and related content have received over four million views to date and counting. Today we host a discussion entitled Fixing the Healthcare System from Within with former Vermont Governor Peter Shumlin, led by Professor Ben Summers. During his three terms, Governor Shumlin positioned his state at the forefront of progressive policies, including the guarantee of universal pre-K education, passing a mandatory GMO labeling law, leading on climate change and achieving near universal health care coverage with the lowest rate of uninsured in the country. In 2011, Governor Shumlin signed into law a measure to create the nation's first single-payer health care system called Green Mountain Care. Today, we will have a robust conversation on efforts to pass that law and what lessons were learned that could inform future efforts to reform health care. Before I turn this discussion over to our moderator, Professor Ben Summers, please join me as we welcome back Governor Peter Shumlin to the Voices in Leadership series at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. Thank you. Governor, delighted to have you here. Thanks so much for sharing your time and experience with us. Um, we're going to start, I think, kind of a little bit of a broader perspective on what leadership means. And, and I would love for you to reflect a bit on your leadership journey. What brought you into a career in public <laughs> service and what kept you there? Well, I actually got into it by mistake. And uh, I'll give you the short version. I'm dyslexic. I had a terrible time learning how to read. And this was before we labeled these things, had special ed. So, you know, there's one teacher in a classroom and you, I, I sat at the back. Anyway, I won't give you a long story about my struggle to learn how to read, but uh, what I can tell you is that I had graduated from Wesleyan. Uh, I was helping my parents. They'd founded something called Putney Student Travel back 69 years ago, which sends educational summer programs for high school students all over the globe. Great programs. And I wanted to help change students' lives. So it runs out of an old cow barn on a dirt road in Vermont, and I was there working away. And the Fed, we had a college in our little town where I was raised that had gone bankrupt when the Vietnam War, during the Vietnam War, if you went to college, you didn't go to war. A lot of people did it. As soon as that ended, a lot of colleges went bankrupt. And there was a little college named Wyndham College and went bankrupt. Anyway, it sat there with leaking roofs and so on and so forth for years. It was a big problem. And the Federal Bureau of Prisons decided to put a maximum security prison there. So a number of us in our community thought, hey, that's probably not the best uh, answer to what's an educational community, downtown, maximum security prison. But our select men, it was all men then, had agreed this was a great idea. They'd been flown down to Allentown. I don't know, they gave them caviar and whatever, and they thought it was great. So we convinced the Federal Bureau of Prisons, with the help of Senator Leahy, who was a younger senator then, uh, to abide by a town vote on the question of whether they come or not, which they'd never done, but they were so sure they could win. Anyway, we went out and we knocked on doors and did what you do, community organizing. We beat them 90-10. I mean, it was a slaughter. And so we were all celebrating, and a bunch of the people that had helped said, hey, someone's got to run for that select board, because if we don't, they're going to come back next year, and they'll know better than to do a town-wide vote. So anyway, we were all going around, and I was like, I can't do it. You know, I've got, like, I'm trying to help build this organization. Everyone was like, hey, and they finally said, Shumlin, you've got to do it. And they got the petitions and filled them out. And that's, I got on the board. Anyway, I was reading in Boston. I promised I'd try to come up with a better solution in the prison because it's really easy to say no in politics. Yeah. It's much harder to say yes. And I'd said no to the prison we all had. Anyway, I said, listen, I'll do my best to find a better solution. So this was pre-internet, you know. I was sitting there reading in Boston Globe one day, and it said, I always read everything about dyslexia. And there was an article in the tucked in the back of the globe that said, Landmark School Prides Crossing Mass wants to start the first college in the nation for dyslexic kids. And I'm like, wow, hello. We jumped in the car. I got the town manager. I was in the board at one. We go down there. We talk to this old, all old white guys of the board. Half of them were asleep. And we were showing them pictures of this college and what it could be. And anyway, 
the long and short of it is, I'll give you the short version, Landmark College is now in its 25th year of, of uh, educating dyslexics and other students who learn differently. It's been a great success. And when I did that, I said, wow, you can get stuff done in public policy. Maybe I'll run for the legislature, and that's how I got started. And as someone who has gone through different elements of, of public service, you know, local government, uh, state rep, state senator, and then governor, how has your perspective changed or developed over time? And, and in particular, what do you think of as the, the leverage points for whether it's state or federal or, or local or, or, you know, to, to influence and impact that, uh, that from the outside as well as then to lead from within? Right. Well, governors are very biased on this on a bipartisan basis. Uh, because we tend to understand that the best job in government, aside from being president of the United States, where you have a lot of ability to make change, is being a governor. Uh, we, you, you might have seen John Hickenlooper was running for president, good friend of mine, great governor of Colorado. You know, the presidential race didn't go well, and in the course of the race, they were trying to get him run for Senate, because if he beats Cory Booker out there, it could flip the Senate. And, uh, I mean, not Cory Booker, Cory Gardner. Gardner, sorry. And uh, anyway, long and short of it is, he said, I'm not cut out to be a senator at one point in the conversation. And I think all governors kind of feel that way. Like, if you want to make change, run for governor. Our feeling is generally that we don't want to sit around in Washington. We don't have the patience to sit in long hearings and talk a lot about things. And not, I would jump out of a window of, of frustration <laughs> right now. So uh, what I found was legis citizen legislature, which Vermont has wonderful. You're there. It's only 16 weeks. You don't have to go on Mondays, so you can actually have a real job. Uh, you go in, you make change. You don't get paid much, but it's a place where people go to because they love their state and want to make change, which is unusual for legislatures, not particularly partisan. Governor is the best job in the country because you can really make change. So that's my bias. Now, I, I you know, bless those who dare spend a lifetime in Congress. I just couldn't do it. And so turning from the kind of broader sets of questions to the, some of the specific policies, you know, there's a lot of interest certainly at our, at our School of Public Health and I think nationally right now in thinking about broad changes in health care. What would you draw on as the, the, the most important lessons from Vermont's experience trying to move towards single payer as we are now in the, uh, the season of Medicare for all as kind of a, a talking point right. in, in the national uh, campaign? Well, I really think that our experience in Vermont uh, could and should be a, a sort of a guinea pig for the folks who are advocating for Medicare for all, which I'm a big believer in. I mean, I believe healthcare should be a right and not a privilege. I've seen enough suffering and enough, you know, all the reasons that I think we all know why this is important. People make terrible choices in our current system. But listen, this is what I found. We probably, I don't think it's bragging to say that our administration took the deepest dive into how a state would move to a publicly financed system with cost controls, with finding ways to spend less for better outcomes, than probably any governor yet in America. When I ran in 2010, I ran on single payer. I was the only governor in America running. I'm going to try to get single payer done. This is what we learned. And it was a hard lesson to learn. But it, it absolutely applies to the Medicare for all debate. If you don't find ways to fix our broken health care system, you can't fix the broken payment system. Why? Listen, I'm a business person. I'm watching my premiums this year go up 11%. Last year it was 14%. Business folks become used to that. Doesn't mean it doesn't hurt, but they become used to it. And what they do is they don't give their employees raises that they should get. It's, in other words, because we're spending more money in a fee-for-service system that rewards quantity of care instead of quality of care, we are spending money faster than we can mint it. So I always say, you know, Trump sort of, he got one thing right. The American people were frustrated with incomes that hadn't changed in 10, 20 years. I mean, he understood that better than the Democrats, fair to say. What he gets wrong is blaming it on the Chinese, blaming it on the rapists coming across the borders and all this other stuff. He's, it's all about the fact that, listen, we're spending money on health care like a bunch of drunken bandits. Now, if we were living to 140 years old, you know, longer than everybody else around us that spends a heck of a lot less, we'd all say, hey, this is worth it. Like, life is pretty good. Let's keep this thing going. The fact of the matter is our outcomes are worse than the countries that spend around us. We're living not as long. We're more obese. This is the first generation of Americans that's going to live less long than their parents. So we keep spending more and more money in a fee-for-service system with lousier outcomes. 
So what I learned the hard way is you've got to do two things simultaneously. You've got to find a way to spend less money for better outcomes, for healthier lives, which isn't very hard. I say small sho shoes to fill in our current system because we tend to reward providers who keep you a little bit sick, not dead, because that doesn't help, but you know, a little bit sick, mm -hmm. keep billing you fee for service, and they're able to pay their bills. Our system rewards quantity like no other system in the world. It doesn't measure outcomes. So what we did in Vermont was got an 1115 11, waiver, I won't bore you with the details, the first state to get permission from CMS and, and the agency to move to a system that rewards you for keeping people healthy instead of spending a lot of money on a fee-for-service system. I say to the, Medi the, the Medicare for All folks, great idea, but you will not get a politician in Washington to pay, to, to vote, to raise taxes, because it's a tax-based system, as fast as the current premium-based system is requiring us to do it. So what we learned in Vermont is we've got this waiver. We actually think it's working. We've got our hospitals, our docs. I won't get into too much in the details, but we, we, you get paid for keeping someone healthy on a capitated payment instead of for the number of things we do to you. Suddenly the providers want to know what you're eating, how your blood pressure is, how the jogging program is going, how cigarettes, how your mental health is, all the things that lead to good healthcare outcomes. They suddenly really care about that. In this system of quantity, they actually don't care that. I'm not going to say they're heartless and they don't care that much. Their financial, I, I won't take it personally. Right, their doctor, financial system isn't rewarded by that kind of outcome. Right. So the lesson was you will not fix the payment system unless you simultaneously fix the broken delivery system. And that was really the big lesson I learned. And, it, and you talked in our comments when we were discussing before the before the, starting the session today that you really thought of there being these two big aspects of what Vermont was trying to do, and that one of them didn't materialize the financing right. side, and that the the care delivery reforms did. Uh, you know, one of the, the the analyses that kind of underlies some of the cost issues that we have ties it to things like administrative spending, right. things like high prices for the same services that are cheaper everywhere else in the world. That uh, single payer advocates say, well, this will this is what you can get with single payer that you can't get no matter how you change the payment delivery system if you're still not willing to negotiate on prices and still not willing to simplify the insurance system. How do you think about that and you know how did you try to build that coalition which ultimately wasn't able to get to the public financing but obviously I, I imagine this was part of that debate. It's interesting it's provider driven. Unlike the managed care thing which was insurance company driven our system that we're expanding with in Vermont is provider driven. So we've got Medicaid, we've got the only waiver in the country where you can take Medicaid, Medicare and private pay and put it in one capitated system. It's being led, believe it or not, by the CEOs of our two biggest hospitals, UVM Medical, University of Vermont Medical, and Dartmouth Hitchcock in New Hampshire, but it's just over the line and everyone in New Hampshire wishes they lived in Vermont. So <laughs> anyway, the, the point I'm making is uh, we, it's provider driven and why? Because if you're a provider in Vermont, particularly a primary care provider or nurse, a chiropractor or whatever, good luck surviving on the current reimbursement system. You can't, you can't. We have primary care docs who are making less money than when they graduated from medical school 30 years ago. What did they want to do? They didn't want to get rich, but they want to make people healthy. And the current system requires them to see more and more people on a shorter, shorter period of time to fix the immediate problem, theoretically, and get paid less than they were getting 30 years ago. So the providers are going, hey, the system's not working for us. We're willing to try something new. And I would argue that most people in healthcare who are providing primary care and many of the others don't want to have more billers in the back office than they have providers trying to make people healthy. People in healthcare actually go into it to make people healthy, not to make a ton of loot. Right. And then, so who was the, you know, what was the biggest political obstacle to getting there? Was it, uh, you know, providers worried about payment? Was it oh, uh, employers it, worried about it, taxes? Was it, it everybody? It's, every, well, it's so easy to scare people. The same, same thing's happening in a Medicare for all argument. And what they all first do is say, wow, look at the taxes. Well, the taxes are pretty astonishing. But what they leave out is those taxes mean that you will not pay for premiums anymore, healthcare premiums. That part of the conversation is somehow lost when we talk about taxes. Now, what's wrong with that politically? Employers pay most of it. 
55% of Vermonters, if you ask them, I bet you if you ask anyone in this room who's on the Harvard Healthcare Plan, and this is a healthcare central right here, the Chan School for Public Health, right? If we ask them, how much does your insurance policy cost a year? They won't be able to tell you. They'll tell you what their contribution is because it comes out of their paycheck, it's right on a stub, but they have no idea. This is what we found in Vermont. When I became governor, we were spending on average about $22,000 a year per family of four. And some of the, the public employee benefits are- Well, just, just average, uh, what's, that's, just, that's what it's costing. It's, yep. This is no big surprise. And with health care costs going as they were, and this is back in, a, there's a 2011 number, 2012 mm -hmm. number, it will be 47,000 in three years. So my point is, when we have the conversation about what we spend and how we move to a finance ba a, a tax-based system, two things. Number one, you can't leave out that there will be no more health care premiums. Number two, you've got a huge problem because most people who have their employer pay don't know what they're paying. And all of a sudden, if you say to them, instead of that system you have with your employer, you're going to get a tax bill in the mail. They go, oh, wait a minute, I'm all for single payer, but wait, no, no, no. I thought that meant free. Are you telling me my taxes are going to go up and my employer's not going to have this burden anymore? You pretty much got to say, yeah, that's what we're saying. So right. that's a huge problem. Yeah. So you mentioned, I think, in, in framing the, the, the impetus for moving towards this sort of uh, reform, the, the, low, the, the outcomes we get, the poor outcomes that the U.S. healthcare system gets. Um, I'd like to kind of situate this conversation a bit more broadly now in the, the uh, conversation about public health, right. right? Where health care is one part, the most expensive part, but most research would suggest probably not the most important part of determining health outcomes. The, you, there was a lot of activity going on in Vermont during your, your tenure in terms of, of public health issues, not just health care, uh, whether it's dealing with natural disasters, genetically modified foods, um, the opioid epidemic. Uh, how did you uh, think about the broader context of public health that, uh, that you were then kind of grappling with outcomes in health care? I'm convinced that you can't move to real health care reform until you have a system that makes people healthy as opposed to gives people lots and lots of unnecessary or, or of quantity of care. Uh, having said that, it's all interrelated. Listen, if you're going to get providers to be paid on a capitated basis to keep you healthy, they're going to want to know that this food supply tells you what you need to know as a consumer. So I said, Listen, I'm not taking sides in the GMO debate, whether it kills you, whether it's good for you, whether, all I'm saying is, I want consumers to have the right to know. The American food industry flips out when you do that. And I kept saying to them, the CEOs of these big companies, the food associations, what are you all afraid of? You know, 63 companies label most of Western Europe, and it hasn't changed their sales. It just gives consumers just like they want to see other things about the ingredients of, of the food they're buying. So I thought that was important to get done. Now, the feds usurped us once we passed it, and Congress did their you know, lobbyist-based doning gift and got rid of us on that one. But I thought it was related to almost everything we did. Climate change. Listen, climate change is going to be the biggest challenge that current health care providers face. It's going to land right in their office because the health effects of the challenge that we're facing as we burn oil and coal uh, with uh, extraordinary, irrational exuberance is going to land on health care providers' plate. So then you ask, well, you know, what about the other issues that you worked on? I say it all is going to come back to the door of folks who are in both public and private health right now. So, you know, more than any time in our history, I would say to healthcare providers, folks in this school, in this community, why does politics matter? It matters to you because the policies that we make about what food we eat, about how, whether or not you can have access to insurance as a right and, and you know, not a privilege, about whether we get off coal and oil and remove, move to renewables, all those issues are going to come right to the door of healthcare providers as we quickly see the effects of the years that we've spent burning carbon, not to mention the current carbon we're putting in the environment. Yeah. And another issue that kind of has 
comes right to the doorstep uh, of providers and, and patients that you worked a lot on was the opioid epidemic. Yeah. Uh, and, and here's another area where it's it's healthcare and it's also not is right. It's, it's the broader kind of economic and social right. factors. What what efforts at the state level do you think can be most effective in in, uh, in battling this? And, and what requires just, you know more federal or interstate cooperation to handle? Well, I got to tell you this this one gets my rage meter going, so I'll try to keep it down. But when you find when you become a governor that when you get into really complex issues like health care or even food labor, whatever it is, that you know things often become a little more gray than what you thought they would be when you actually get into the details of trying to fix it. On opiates, it drives me crazy because this one is, this is a problem created by big pharma that profits big pharma to this day. When I dedicated my State of the State address to the opiate crisis in Vermont, first of all, my staff flipped out. You're not going to do that. Vermont, maple syrup, Ben & Jerry's ice cream, farms, skiing, clean. You're going to tell everybody we got a bunch of, you know, heroin and opiate f folks, you know, suffering from opiate disorder. Are you insane? I said, no, we're going to because my job as governor is to protect our quality of life, and this is the one thing that could drown us. This is the one thing that could drown us. Why did I know that? Because small state governors spend lots of time out in the field, and I constantly had folks after I gave big goofy speeches coming up to me afterwards and looking down in shame and said, Governor, I want to tell you about my son. I want to tell you about my daughter. I want to tell you about my grandkids that we now have because of what's happening to the rest of, you know, to, to one of our relatives. I mean, you just couldn't make it up. And so I started digging in, you know, and I don't learn traditionally. I'm a dyslex. I got to see it. So you know what I did? I went into the prisons. I talked to the folks who were non-criminal, you know, who were not, who didn't have, who didn't have non-violent offenders. I went and talked to them. Women's prison, man, I drove my security team nuts because I wouldn't let them go into the cells with me. I said, who do you think they hate more, me or you? You arrested them. Anyway, I talked to the judiciary. I said, listen, what's going on here? I talked to providers, I talked to treatment folks, I talked to everybody I could, and I found out we were doing almost everything wrong. So I said, we got to do two things. This is a short version. In this speech, I said, we're going to reform our criminal justice system so this is a disease and not a crime. If you get charged and go into treatment, you'll never have a criminal record, you'll never see a judge. We're going to try to make you better, just like we would if you came down with cancer. So we did that over time. Second, I said, we can't have waiting lines for treatment any more than we can have waiting lines for cancer or any other disease. Over a long period of time, we got rid of the waiting lines. We built out treatment like mad. We got Narcan in everybody's hands. We did all the things that everybody else is doing. Here's the one thing we didn't do. Solve the problem. When I gave that speech, there was a good American dying every 22 minutes from opiate disorder. Today, they die every 13 minutes. Why? Only one reason. 85% of folks who are heroin addicted started with pills. When we FDA approved OxyContin in the 90s and we passed it out like candy, and I mean it, 2010, 250 million prescriptions. We only have about 250 million adult Americans. Everyone got a bottle on average, <laughs> right? So we passed these pills out like candy. Purdue told us it was non-addictive. They swore to the FDA. Then they admitted they lied when all these healthcare providers started seeing people with needles in their arms. And, and uh, they paid a fine, by the way, 600 and something million. Well, they sold, you know, 11 billion of it that year alone. My point is, this is so simple. Why wouldn't the FDA go, hey, they lied to us. Let's relook at the evidence and rethink how we prescribe pain, kill, pain pills in America. We made it the fifth symptom, vital symptom. Pain is now the fifth vital symptom in our healthcare system. I mean, these, Bonnie and Clyde had nothing on these guys. Now they're finally going to pay a little money. My point is, the Sackler family is going to pay some billions of dollars now, finally. Guess where most of that money is going to go? To Big Pharma, the folks who gave the pills in the first place, not the drug dealers from South America that Trump and so forth talks about. No, it was CVS, and it was the healthcare system, it was the pill mills, it was the system that sold legal drugs to Americans that got them addicted to heroin, and guess what it cost me from pharma-produced products in Vermont to take someone off this stuff, to, to help give them the drugs they need to stay off it, it's about eighteen to $22,000 a year. So the Sackler settlement's going to go to pharma to for the pills that you need to stay off the pills they created in the first place. For Narcan, when I gave the speech, it was about $12 a dose. Now it's about 80 To the b drugs they've made now for constipation from opiates. Mm -hmm. You know, all the other drugs, we can, we can go through the list. 
most of the money from the crisis is going to go to the folks who created the crisis. And I say, for God's sake, why doesn't some presidential candidate say, you elect me president of the United States, and I'm going to put an FDA in there that's going to re-examine this decision because there's no country in the world that would pass out painkillers like we do. I'll close with this story. I was in Vietnam. I do a lot of, bit, you know, for travel or educational programs. I'm in Asia a lot. I go into, in, Vietnam is one of the countries where you go to the drugstore and the provider is kind of behind the counter and they, they tell you what you need and you go out. You know, I got a sore back. So I thought, what, how are they avoiding this problem we have? Imagine if you could just go into the drugstore here and get any drug you wanted. It would be, you wouldn't need the pill mills, right? So I go in and I say, hey, I got a bad back. Um, I left my oxys in the United States. I just need about 10 of them. Could you, I just need, first three people turned me down. So I thought, well, I must have a language barrier. I don't speak Vietnamese. I finally got in Hanoi into a, a pharmacy that they spoke perfect English. You know what she said to me? In one of the most repressive governments probably in the, you know, in the world. She said, you know, sir, uh, we don't sell those drugs in Vietnam. They will kill you. Hmm. So in our last few minutes, I promised that I would end on a brighter note. <laughs> so, yeah, can you cheer us up? <laughs> well, I'm hoping you're going to cheer us up. Oh, so my question, my question for you is, uh, thinking back on, on all years in public service, what, uh, what is the, the accomplishment or the, the moment that you're proudest of and that can give our students mm -hmm. uh, some, some hope for the future and what they can accomplish if they do go into public life? There's nothing more important than going into public life. <clears throat> and we need more health care providers going into public life. Some of the best governors and public servants I knew had been in the health care system. It's where the rubber hits the road right now. I would say, here's my answer, what I say to folks is, listen, I think one of the problems with our democracy has got a number of problems, notably big money and campaigns. But the other problem is, I was a temp. I always saw myself as a temp. I was a person that you called in to do something, and then when the job was done, I would get out of the way. I wasn't on the full-time payroll. In other words, I wasn't looking for a J-O-B. I actually took a pay cut to be a governor, okay? I'm a business person. So I think one of the things I say to public servants who are aspiring to be public servants is, listen, why? Why do you want to serve? Do you want to serve because you want to be great? Because you want to be noticed? Because you want glamour and power? If so, I'd encourage you not to, because frankly, it isn't all that much, you know, the quality of life, I've just got to tell you, you know, if you like having a normal life with friends and all that, you work all the time. Your, your wife or husband or whoever you live with, if anyone will live with you, will want to strangle you. Uh, your kids aren't particularly pleased. Uh, it's not good for family. So my point is, what I say is if you're motivated to make change, to make a difference, there's no better thing you can do. But if you want it to be your J-O-B, you won't make change because you're going to think about number one, how do I get reelected? That's the problem with Congress. It didn't used to be a full-time job. It used to be you went, you did your public service, you went back to what you did. Governors tend to go in, do what they're supposed to do and get out of the way. I say what I was most proud of and what I would encourage people to do is be a temp. Don't try to be a full-time employee because then you will make real change. You don't care what the polls say. You don't care what the consequences are, within reason. You'll get the job done that you went to do. If you're looking for a career, there's much better ways to make a living in terms of quality of life. Great. Well, I hope Harvard will work as a, an effective temp agency and get all of you out into <laughs> careers of great public service. Um, governor, thanks so temp. much. Be a temp. Be a temp. Uh, let, let's give the governor a big round of applause. Thank you so much for your time. Great to be here.